So this morning, the last Sundays of every month is our love lounge service in the Gateway Church. Is where we're if, you're gonna, if you're excited, you can express your excitement better. Amen. So it's where we talk about love, relationships, marriage, and everything in between. And today, I want to talk on the, you know, address the common mistakes that couples make, or we can just say men and women make that destroy their marriages, common mistakes. Oftentimes, we overlook these mistakes or we take them for granted or these things for granted, and that's why they end up becoming errors that may eventually destroy the matrimony. Starting out this morning, I want us to understand that there are basically three models of marriage. Three models of marriage. The first model is what I call the blind date model. The blind date model. Now, what's the blind date model? Um, for some of us that have gone on blind dates before, you know, uh, maybe you've met someone online and the first time you're going to meet the person, you don't even have an idea of what you are going to meet, right? And some people go into marriage without mindset, without approach, right? Um, there is this um, adage that says that uh, marriage is a black market, right? You never know what you are going into. So whatever you find, you just, you know, adjust, <laughs> you know. So that, 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 that model exists, right? And for the most part, especially for um, religious people, they um, approach marriage with that model, with that sense of, you know, it's, it's a blind date kind of a thing. You just never know what's going to happen. So you just go into it, you know, um, being blind in a sense, right? Uh, so we need to understand that's the first model. The second model is what I call the dominant submissive model. The dominant submissive model. The dominant submissive model. Now, this is the model whereby one um, of the party is dominant in the relationship. It can be the man, it can be the woman. It's not, um, when we talk about dominance, dominance could, um, you could dominate someone emotionally, you could dominate someone physically, right? Um, uh, manipulation is a form of domination, right? So some people believe in that um, dominant submissive model in the sense that, you know, um, someone is superior in that institution while the other person is inferior. Now, I want us to understand this morning that if you are a believer, um, that model is unscriptural. You see, it may be cultural, it may be acceptable traditionally, but it is not scriptural. Because the Bible says that, you know, there is no male or female in Christ. So, when we go into marriage with that, you know, the blind death, blind death model, or with the dominant submissive model, we will never get the best out of it. We'll never get the best out of it. Because God never told the man to, um, to dominate another man. In Genesis 1 in verse, you know, um, 26 to 28, um, God said, let us make man after our own image and after our own likeness, he says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You see that God never said that the man should dominate the woman, neither did he say the woman should dominate the man. Right, so um, that submissive or dominant submissive model is not scriptural. Neither is the blind date model scriptural. You see, the reason why it's not scriptural is this. As a New Testament believer, we need to understand that you don't go into a relationship or into marriage to find out if it will work. You go into it because there is already an assurance in your spirit that this is the relationship you should go into. Right, so that already knocks off because Jesus said that, you know, when the spirit of truth is called, he said he will guide you into all truth. So that already knocks off the blind date model. It simply means you should go into that institution informed, especially for those of us that are still single. Now, the third model, which I believe is God's model, is the partnership model. The partnership model. The partnership model. The partnership model. That's why I think it's Genesis 2 and verse 18. God said it is not good for man to be alone. And the word man there is referring to Adam. Talking about mankind. It's not just talking about the male gender or the female gender. It's talking about the fact that man is not meant to be alone. And we see Jesus exemplify that, right, in his earthly ministry. You see Jesus having disciples. You see, Jesus was God in human flesh. 
yet he surrounded himself with people. He walked hand in hand with people. He could have done everything he did by himself. As a matter of fact, you realize if you study the scriptures, right, the only miracle that Jesus performed, right, that involved someone directly was the miracle of when he told Peter to go to the, you know, to go catch a fish when they asked him to pay the, um, his tax. And um, he said to Peter, because you are a fisherman, so that's your area of expertise. Go catch the fish. And the first fish you find, you will see money in its mouth. He said, with that money, pay taxes. So that's the only miracle, as it were, that Jesus, right, engaged the help of someone. You see, uh, so it's not that Jesus couldn't have done everything by himself, but he was trying to show us a template, a model of partnership. In Osea chapter 4 and verse 6, Osea chapter 4 and verse 6, the Good New Translation. Okay, the King James Version says, my people are destroyed for they lack knowledge. Now, I want everybody to look at this scripture. It's very important because we live in an environment that um, usually falls on one side of the road. Now, what do I mean by that? The average believer is either focused on the wisdom of God, ignoring the power of God, or focusing on the power of God and ignoring the wisdom of God. And the Bible makes us to understand that Christ has been made unto us the wisdom and the power of God. Everything that is going to work requires the wisdom and the power of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So here God was saying to the children of Israel, he said, you are destroyed simply because you lack knowledge. He said, because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. Knowledge is that important to God. God is saying, because you have not prioritized knowledge, I will also not prioritize you. He didn't say, I will reject you because you are not saved. He didn't say, I will reject you because you are not in a covenant with me. It simply means you can be saved, be in covenant with God, have the Holy Spirit, be tongue talking, demon chasing, and yet experience, in quotes, some measure of rejection from God. He said, because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you, that you shall be no more priest to me, seeing that you have forgotten the law of your God, and I will also forget your children. Now, please understand this. The priority or the lack of it that you place on knowledge will not only affect you, it will affect your um, children and your children's children yet unborn. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying this morning? And please realize this. What you don't know, you don't know. What you don't know, you don't know. You know, there's a song a while back that says, um, what you don't know, you know, makes you stronger. Or sorry, what does not kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> you know, there's this school of thought that also says that, you know, uh, what you don't know cannot kill you. If you don't know there is poison in the food and you eat the food, you will die. You know, this idea of what you don't know cannot kill you. It will kill you faster. Because even if you get to the hospital, maybe um, they want to, you know, intervene. And they ask you, what do you eat? And I say, you don't know. What's wrong? I don't know. It will even make the death faster. Because there's no way they can intervene in that process. So what you don't know can kill you. And what people don't know often destroys their marriages. It destroys their relationships. There are many marriages that could have worked out, but... For the fact that the people, right, in that institution, one or both parties, right, have embraced ignorance as a lifestyle. And please understand this. In marriage, one person cannot carry the weight. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The weight of marriage is too big for one person to carry. So if it is one person that is going after knowledge and the, pres the other person stays in the zone of ignorance, that marriage will still not work the way it's supposed to work. You know, the meaning, when you look at the word ignorance, you actually see the word ignore. It simply means knowledge is presented to you. Wisdom is presented to you, but you ignore it. You believe it's not that important. It's not that necessary. What is it? You must have had people say things like, you know, <laughs> most times when I write or post videos online about relationships, I, you know, it, it's amazing. It just tells me the mindset of the average Nigerian. You know, <laughs> Different mindsets people have about marriage. People say things like, you know, this thing is a matter of luck. There are really no rules to it. Really. So imagine you buying a gadget, very expensive one, and when you get to the store where you want to buy it, this is a gadget you've never used before. You don't even know how to use it. 
But the way the salesperson, you know, sold it to you, you feel it is something you should have. So they said, you know what? Just take it home. Go and figure it out. There is no manual. And even as a salesperson, I can't teach you how to make it work. Just go and figure it out. Will you buy that kind of product? So, if man is intelligent enough to put on his manual in anything he creates, you think God that gave man sense will not be smart enough to give a manual for the institution he created. Let me tell you this. The only institution that God really created was a family unit. Marriage was an intervention, I'm sorry, the church, right, was the second institution it created. And it was meant to be an intervention and a reintroduction of the family unit. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? If, see, if, <laughs> don't let me go into that because I know I'm speaking to a larger audience this morning. Praise the Lord. So what you don't know, you don't know. All you know is all you have learned. And all you have learned is not all there is to learn. I want you to look at your neighbor, say neighbor. Is that neighbor smiling to you this morning? <laughs> Say smiling neighbor. smiling neighbor. If that person is not smiling, just think the neighbor. <laughs> Say smiling neighbor. smiling neighbor. What you don't know, you don't know. Tell that neighbor, say all you know is all you have learned. And all you have learned is not all there is to learn. Ah. So many of us grew up, especially for the ladies, if you grew up in a very traditional and cultural setting, you know, when you are getting to a marriageable age, they will tell the woman, make sure you cook as you are, or you are about to get married. Say, make sure you are cooking for your husband, though, and make sure, you know. That information is valid, but it's incomplete. Marriage does not work by food. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because you can get that in a restaurant. So that's native intelligence. And the unfortunate thing is many people build this institution on traditional, cultural, and native intelligence. And let me tell you this, those things change over time. And you can afford to build your life on something that is transient, something that is not solid. I want us to know this morning that a good marriage is one of the greatest gifts you can give to yourself, to your destiny, and to your generations yet unborn. I'm going to say that again. A good marriage is one of the greatest gifts. I'm always surprised at how many people or how much people trivialize their marriage at the expense, you know, uh, pursuing other things. They pursue other things at the expense of their marriage. But please never forget this. A good marriage is one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself. It's one of the greatest gifts you can give to your destiny because there is a, there, there is a dimension of your destiny you will never achieve if you don't have a good marriage. Trust me. Trust me. And one of the greatest gifts you can, uh, uh, it's also one of the greatest gifts you can give to yourself, right, because of your generations yet unborn. Because of your generations yet unborn. You see the era of Abraham, right, and Sarah giving back to Ishmael. Generations yet unborn after them is still paying for it. That's why we have ISIS. That's why we have Al-Qaeda and all those guys. It's the era of somebody's marriage. Did you see that? The error of somebody's marriage. Generations yet on, after them, is still paying for it. So let me tell you this. Don't think the success or the failure of your marriage is only restricted to you. No, it's not. Yesterday I was, you know, I, I saw, uh, uh, you know, um, what do they call it now? A Facebook reel. You know, so I was showing to some of the people <laughs> that were in church yesterday, you know, after the recalibrate intensity. And if not be attending the recalibrate intensive, you are sure changing yourself, right? There's this, this particular, a, a young mother, you know, she was twerking, twerking passionately. <laughs> and they shifted the camera to the baby. That baby cannot be up to, we can't be, I don't think the baby is even up to one, uh, two or thereabout. The baby was also twerking passionately. See, children don't do what you tell them. They do what they see. If you tell, you see, the reason why many of us are struggling in marriage and may likely struggle is because you don't have a foundation and a model of a successful marriage. If I ask the average person here now, how many of us want the marriage of our parents? Most likely, if we have people raise up their hand, it will be 10%. Now, you don't like the marriage of your parents and you are not learning how to do it better. What do you think you will reproduce? People only become a visible expression of the reality that's been presented to them over time. 
Haven't you seen people who hated? It might even be you. You hated something in your parents. In fact, you attacked it. But over the years, you realize you started behaving that same way. How was what I'm talking about? That's why when you look at it, you say abusive men mostly came from abusive homes where they saw the father being abusive. I say, ah, I hated this growing up. But if you don't do something about it, it's not enough to hate it. You must do something about it. And one of the things you need to do about it is to acquire the knowledge required to make better decisions. It's amazing that everybody wants to change. Right? Everybody wants change, sorry. Everybody wants change, but nobody wants to change. Everybody wants change. If you ask the average person, you know, do you want things to change? They say, oh, of course, yes. You want your finances to change? Yes. You want your marriage to change? Yes. So do you want to change? No. <laughs> but nothing will change if you don't change. Nothing will change if you don't change. You see, I like to do um, what they call long-term thinking, right? Back from the future thinking. Oftentimes, I like to sit down and just imagine, if I continue the way I'm behaving now, where will I end up five, ten years from now? Many people don't do that. Many people don't do that. And I like, you see, I have conversations with myself. A lot of people don't do that. The prodigal son kept living from error to error until the day the Bible says he came to himself. Many of us go to people, we don't come to ourselves. The Bible says he came to himself and he said, ah, ah. The people in my father's house, even the servants, they are not struggling like this. He said, I will arise. You see, he was not talking to someone, he was talking to himself. I will arise. I will go to my father's house. I will apologize. I will say this. I will say that. The Bible says in the next verse, and he arose and did everything that he had said he would do because he came to himself. The question is, when was the last time you came to yourself? When was the last time you fixed an appointment with yourself and you asked yourself genuinely, especially in this context of this morning's discussion, that with the level of knowledge I have and my behavioral pattern, can I have a successful home? Now, the only one that can answer that question. Many of us never ask that question. We just live life on autopilot, expecting that because I pray. Let me tell you this. A good marriage is not a reward for being a Christian. Write that down and never forget it. A good marriage is not a reward for being a good Christian. That's why you see Christians tongue talking, even preachers whose marriages are failing. And you see people who are not so serious with God and their marriages are working. Simply because maybe in that area of their own life, right, they took initiative. They looked, searched for the knowledge, right, went for courses, read books, went for counseling, right? And as a result, they began to make better decisions, better choices, which eventually led to a better outcome. For those of us that are single, please understand this. The married people will agree with what I'm about to say. Romantic love is a psychological trick. I'm going to say that again and explain what I mean. Romantic love is a psychological trick. It does not last. What do I mean by that? Romantic love is what you experience at the foundational stages, right, of a relationship. The foundational stages of attraction. The foundational stages of marriage. Now, the purpose, it has its purpose. But the reason why it never lasts is because many people are trying to overextend this purpose. Its purpose is to bond you together, right, in your relationship or marriage, in the initial stages of partnership. But it is too weak a foundation to build a marriage on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because if there is no romantic attraction, you see, most likely you will never get married. There is this spark that shows up, right, for a man to say, ah, I must get that woman. I must marry that babe. Ah, I want that at all costs. Do you see that? But that attraction alone cannot be the foundation for a successful marriage. It can be. It can be. It can be. Its purpose is to create that bond in the initial stages. But you see, it is the decisions that you make going forward that will eventually determine the success or the failure of that marriage. So please understand this Genesis. I want us to see something in Genesis 26. Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26, in verse 34 to 35. Genesis 26, 34 to 35. Genesis 26, 34 to 35. Let me tell you this. As believers, and everyone under the sound of my voice, please listen to this. God is particular about who you marry. Especially for those of us that are single. 
And for those of us that are married, God is interested in the success of your marriage. And the devil is also interested in his failure. The Bible says Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Etite, and Bashima, the daughter of Elon, the Etite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. What was the grief of mind? Not that he got married, but the kind of person he married. Now, there are decisions you make maritally that is a grief of heart to God. And God just looks and says, ah, is this the best choice you could have made? Are you telling me that with all the investment of heaven in you, this is your best decision? You mean you ignore the manual? You bypassed my template and you say, ah, this is what I want. <laughs> You see, just like I said moments earlier, God has a manual for marriage, and that manual is his word. That manual is his word. That manual is his word. Hmm. See, just like um, you don't take an exotic car, a luxurious car to just anybody to operate on. Huh? <laughs> You can't buy a 50 million naira car or 100 million. Let's say a Rolls Royce. You now take it to Bodamuda, the mechanic. We used to have a mechanic like that. I'll never forget him. Bodamuda. When Bodamuda repairs the car, as you take the car home, that thing will be repaired, but something else has gotten spoiled. Bodamuda. I remember some, <laughs> like three years ago, I saw him say, ah, but <laughs> He thought I was going to remember, ah, thank God. At a point, he became a devourer. A devourer. <laughs> you know, and that's the approach some people have. They just, they, they ask just anybody for counsel on the road. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And those ones, who, you don't, you see, you, <laughs> I say I have a long way to go, so let me just leave that. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 11. Malachi 2 and verse 11. Malachi 2 and verse 11. The Bible says, Judah had dealt treacherously and an abomination is committed in Israel. Now, just pay attention to what he's saying. He says an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Because, that word for simply means because. It says, because Judah has profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved. And has done what? And has done what? He has married the daughter of a strange God. According to God's standard, that's abomination. You would have thought maybe he said, and Judah slapped the high priest in the temple. But God is saying here that he has profaned his holiness. How? Because he married the daughter of a strange God. The Good News Bible puts it this way. It says the people of Judah have broken their promise to God and done a horrible thing in Jerusalem and over all the country. Did you see that? Your decision does not just affect you. So the foundation of every heal in society is the family unit. If you can get the family unit right, every thief comes from a house. Isn't it? Every swindler comes from a house. Everyone that embezzles public funds comes from a house. They were raised in a particular house that made them feel it is okay. Certain values were not imputed into them. That's why you see, the Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he's grown, he will not depart from it. There are certain things that when you probe, when you are, <laughs> let me put it this way, when it has been programmed into you, no matter how much you try to deviate from it, you will still come back to that programming. You will come back. You will come back. You will come back. <laughs> it says they have defied the temple which the Lord loves. Men have married women who worship foreign gods. So in the process of building partnership with your significant order, please understand that there are certain common mistakes you need to look out for. The Bible says a prudent man forces the evil and he hides himself. The reason why we're talking about this is so that you know what to look out for. And reposition yourself so you don't fall into these errors. Number one is thinking the wedding is the marriage. That's the number one mistake. Thinking the wedding is what? I can't hear you. 
thinking the wedding is what? And this is not just singles. You see, and I think this affects men the most because men are goal oriented. When a man wants to get married, when a man likes a woman, the woman is a goal. It's not, it's just the average wire. The wedding is the goal. Once the wedding has been done, psychologically, it's moving to something else. So unconsciously, he believes ah, we are married now. So everything will sort itself out. No, it never does. And you see, for the single, they just believe, ah, if my wedding can just be superb, if it can trend, our marriage will trend. They don't say it like that, but it's an unconscious delusion. Making people to see. That's why you see the preparation people put into a wedding. It does not match with the preparation they put in marriage. There are people that even before they meet the person, they've already planned everything out. Before they meet the person, they will get married. The call of the day, the hall, the car that will take them from church to reception. Everything has been planned out. The vendor of the day, if it is written out, even before they met the person. And it's not just women that think like that. Some men also think like that. So the moment they enter into a relationship, it is about the fulfillment of that goal of the wedding. So the goal is about how this must happen, this must happen, this must happen. And there is no consciousness, right, that this wedding we are planning for is not the real thing. It's an introduction into the real thing. For instance, when we're in school, the first class of every course, there is always an introductory class, isn't it? Where the lecturer or the professor will come and say, this is what we'll be learning in this semester. You see, you cannot use that introductory class to go and write exam. You can't say, ah, no, I was at the introductory class. So we've not been seeing you in class in the last 10 weeks. Why have you not been coming to class? I was in the introductory class. Introductory class is not class. So for many of us, we need to have that understanding that wedding is introductory class. It is not the class. Wedding is an event. Marriage is a life. Wedding is for a day. Marriage is meant to be for a lifetime. Wedding is for people. Marriage is for you. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? But a lot of us spend so much. When I mean spend so much, I'm not just talking about in terms of money. Spend so much attention, so much time, right? So much emotions in trying to make that one day work while ignoring what we should invest or what requires the investment of our time, our energy, and our resources. Please understand this. Marriage is a covenant. I'm going to say that again. It is a covenant and not a contract. And in a covenant, permit me, the English is, in, fact, in the context in which I want to put it, is very correct. A covenant cannot happen until there is a death of two people and the resurrection of one people. Mama said, no, pastor is one person. I know. I went to school. I read English. A covenant, you can't say a covenant is in place until two people die. And when they resurrect, they are no longer two separate entities. They are now seen as one. That's why the Bible says, and the two shall become one. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So in marriage, if you must have an understanding of marriage, if it is ever going to work, the foundational knowledge you must have is that marriage is a covenant. It's not a contract. It's not a contract. What that simply means is that in marriage, the moment you say I do, self must die. The two no longer exist. It is the one that must be prioritized. And I'm still going to come to that in a couple of minutes. When your focus is the wedding and not the marriage, you will choose wrongly and make destructive decisions. For those of us that are single, you will choose wrongly. And for those of us that are married, you will begin to make destructive decisions. One of the destructive decisions you will make is that you will focus more on beauty for the single than trust. You will focus more on beauty or looks and someness more than character. I don't know if this has ever happened to you before. Maybe, you, you know, there's a lot of stories now on abuse, this, abuse, that. Now, I'm not saying that everyone that is abused has a bad character. Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But have you ever seen the picture of someone abused who is so beautiful and you are wondering, what should I think a man is beating this kind of beautiful woman? 
Because before he married her, he was seeing the beauty. After the marriage, the beauty is no longer priority. So what we think, oh, it's so important, you see, that's, what, that's why I said romantic love is a psychological trick. The goal is to create a bond. The goal is to attract in the initial stages. But it is too weak a foundation to build a union on. One of the destructive decisions people make when they don't understand that the wedding is not the marriage is that they focus on charm instead of genuine spirituality. So let me tell you this, even the devil attends short service. Do I need to say that again? The devil attended the service where God was preaching. God. <laughs> Job chapter 1, the Bible says God was having a meeting in heaven and the devil showed up. And then Gabriel did not stop him at heaven's gate. Said, no, you can't come in. He entered confidently and had a conversation with God. Isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> Have you ever thought about it? So, if the devil could attend God's service, what makes you think he can attend your church service? Because I've had people say things like, oh, I met him. He said, that's it, Job 1 and verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And God did not say, Satan, what are you doing here? He said, oh, where, where are you coming from? What's up? What's, what's the goal now? He said, go to verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, where are you coming from? So it simply means that it's not the first time you always show up. Ah, people don't say, boy, lady, where are you coming from? Ah, ah, oh, God. <laughs> Let's do that for some other time. Praise the Lord. So please understand this. The wedding, because I still have a long way to go, so let me just wrap up with that. The wedding is not the marriage. The wedding is not the marriage. The wedding is not the marriage. Number two, it's not putting in the work required to make things work. Not putting in the work required to make things work. I'm always amazed at how many people desire the success of other people, especially in this context, the success of other people's marriage. They admire it. Oh, they look cute together. Oh, see how these, the man is doing this. See how the wife is. What they don't find out is what are they doing behind the scene. Because let me tell you this. The secret of anything successful is not what you see in public. Never forget that. The secret of a business, the secret of a ministry, the secret of a marriage, the secret of whatever of a career is not what you see in public. Never. There is an engine room controlling anything that is working on the outside. And that is where the work is. When you go to your favorite restaurant, do you see the chef? No. Do you see people sweating? <laughs> do you see that? No. They just bring the food. After people have sweated, done so many things, you don't experience it. In the restaurants where you eat, there is a sea. Everywhere is chilled. But the kitchen is not chilled. So there is a work. That must be put in place. That's why I love what Jesus said in John 9 and verse 4. He said, I must walk the works of him that sent me while it is day. He says, the night comes when no man can walk. What that simply means is that there is a time that if you don't do the work required, your work will no longer make sense. How about you seen people that they don't believe in counseling? Until the marriage is about to fall apart, they will not be coming for counseling. Most times, the counselors just chop their money because it's too late. Often times it's usually too late because they now <laughs> they expect the counselor to solve in one hour a problem of 15 years. It never works. And those kind of people they want fire brigade approach. What can you do now? What can we? What can we do now? You, it's not, you see, you can't solve through a miracle what you brought yourself into through behavior. You can't. Some people even expect the pastor to just lay hand and the marriage will just become so it never works never works never works look at your neighbor and say neighbor are you willing to put in the work many invest their time energy and resources into making the wedding work they are, um, the business they are engaging to work their career to work but they don't invest anything in marriage they don't put in the work you can see people wake up very early in the morning, 5.30 on the way to work. Why? Because they want to succeed at that work. But you can't see them putting in any energy in the relationship. 
someone I respect so much, in fact, one of the most respected person personally, one of the people I respect the most on this earth, you know, years ago, I heard him say something that has blessed me, you know. He said, someone was asking him a question, you know, it was, it was um, an interactive forum. So the person said, with your busy schedule, you know, we've also noticed that you've been able to balance marriage, you know, business, you know, ministry and so many things. He said, have you been able to do it? He said, the first thing I block out every year, he said, number one is time alone with God. Number two, time with family. He said, before I accept any speaking gig, accept any ministration, accept anything, he said, the time for family has already been blocked out in my calendar. Many of us, we don't create time for family and we just expect the family to succeed. For those of us that have kids, we don't create time with kids. It's, it's amazing today that it's strangers raising children. It has even almost become, a, you know, an excuse. I've had people say it over and over again that it is becoming, it's getting to a point of annoyance. That you know it's not possible, it's not possible. That in this age and time, you must have a house help. There is nothing wrong in having house help. But you can't expect the house help to take your place. When the house help now becomes the one cookie for your husband, cookie for your children, your children don't even know the taste of your own food. So what you are doing unconsciously is you are raising the house help, destroying the life of your children. Because knowing how to cook is part of home training. And cooking is not meant only for girls. Cooking is meant for humans because it is human beings that eat. Anybody that must eat must know how to cook. But you hear what I'm saying? Oh, but they say you should cook rice. You will cook salt and add rice. Because nobody taught you. House made it. See, the truth is, I've, I'm, I'm currently doing a research, and very soon I will come out with it. I've realized that there is usually a faulty foundation, right, in the lives of almost everyone that was raised by ourselves. I've not come to my decision yet. But it's the research I'm currently doing. And I'm the only one that knows that. In fact, my wife is just hearing it for the first time. I'm still doing my research. Studying some families. You see, and everyone I've studied, I've realized, there is usually something faulty. So, you see, they call it house help because the house help is supposed to help you. Not take over the responsibility. Not take over the responsibility. You must put in the work. Because it's not the house help that married you. Or your husband or your wife. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? You know, there are some people that don't know how to clean house because housemaid does all the cleaning. It's a problem. There are kids, in fact, some adults that can't wash plates. Adults. You tell them to go and wash plates, they will break it. Because they didn't practice from age five where they broke the plates. Ah? Uh, and somebody told them, go and wash it again. Like my mom growing up, my mom say, how many, <laughs> she will say it in her language. She say, if you break any plate, I will use it to give you tribal marks. So you look at yourself, say, ah, now there's nothing wrong in tribal marks if you have it. But I looked at my sisters, they didn't have. And I said, will I will not be the one to have it? And so as I'll be washing the plate, I'll be very careful. Praise the Lord. Am I making sense this morning? Marriages don't work on autopilot. Number two, marriages don't work by prophecy. Number three, marriages don't work by the grace of God. By the grace of God, we sort us out. At our wedding, it was Pastor So and So that prophesied over us. Good for you. It doesn't mean it will work. If you don't put in the work, it may never work. It may never work. It may never work. See, let me tell you this. This just came to my mind. I think I need to say it. For those of us that have house help, your children are watching TV. House help is working. It's a wrong programming for your children. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It is a very wrong programming. Very, very, very wrong programming. Number three mistake couples make is not working in love towards each other. Not walking in love towards each other. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that they don't love each other. I'm talking about walking in love. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. 
Jesus said to his disciples in John 13 and verse 35, the Amplified Version. He says, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you have love and unselfish concern for one another. You see, one of the ways you should differentiate between the marriage of a believer and an unbeliever, right, is the God kind of love. And I love the way the Amplified Version broke it down. He said, to have love and unselfish concern for one another. It's amazing how, as individuals, we walk in love towards everybody, except the, the ones we claim to love. And please understand, this love is demonstrated through, number one, the genuine demonstration of forgiveness. You can't say you love somebody that you don't forgive. You are constantly in malice with. You see people who claim to be married, they might not talk to each other for one week. But yet their friend offended them yesterday. The following day, they have finished the fight. You know they behave like that too. Uh, in an Arabic show you do, stop them, I don't like them. They finished. But the one they claim to love, they are still fighting. You see, let me tell you this. <laughs> the foundation of a successful relationship and marriage uh, is to be spirit-filled. You can learn all the principle, principle. That's why you see this thing cannot work without God, taking him out of the equation. Genuine love is also demonstrated through constant demonstration of selflessness. Selflessness. You can't claim to love someone and you are selfish in that relationship. Everything is about you. That's why you notice that when you just fall in love, you always, especially for the men, you always want to do things. You want to do this, you want to do that. As you get married, now you have achieved your goal. Can't you do it yourself? What's wrong with your hand? <laughs> Genuine love is also demonstrated through a lifestyle of generosity. A lifestyle of generosity. A lifestyle of generosity. If you are not generous in your relationship and marriage, something is wrong. And generosity is not only from the man to the woman. It should also be from the woman to the man. Because we loved each other. I'm not this. I've had some men say stupid things like, my love can take care of us. It's a lie. It doesn't work. Nobody can sustain it. It's supposed to be symbiotic. So please understand this. If you are in a relationship, I know some people don't know because of how they've been consciously programmed or unconsciously programmed and traditionally raised. That a woman is just meant to be receiving and receiving and receiving. It is a red flag, sir. Or ma, if you are in a relationship and the woman you are dating, you can't point to one thing she did for you. It's a red flag. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. You can't claim to love someone you don't give to. Giving should be natural. It should be a lifestyle. Now, when I say giving, there has to be a balance to it. Don't try to buy love through gifts. That's another extreme of foolishness. I hear what I'm saying. So as a lady, you are earning well. You have properties, you know, stocks, investments. And you meet this guy. Maybe he's just coming up with his eye. Don't be throwing things in his face. That, Do you know I have a land in Lekki? I have one in a Beju Lekki. I have one in Makogi. See, you have already influenced his thoughts. He himself will not even know that he does not really love you. What he will see is a financial security. That, ah, this babe must not go. Love is also demonstrated through the willingness to adapt and be flexible. This is all, this is all the, the third mistake that is not working in love towards each other. Love is demonstrated through forgiveness, selflessness, generosity, adaptability. One of the ways we demonstrate love is that you are adaptable and flexible. You are adaptable and what? And flexible. Adaptable and flexible. About people say things like, this is the way I am, this is the way I am. You can't talk like that if you want to get married or if you are married. So even my family members know me. Why didn't you marry one of them? And even my dad, growing up, even my dad knows that's who I am. You should have married your dad. Or even my mom. Why should you go and marry your mom? You should have gone to the courts together and signed register. 
I just married your mom. Since they understand you. You can't remain who you are in marriage. That's one of the demonstrations of love. Do you think it was convenient uh, for Jesus to leave the father and spend 33 and a half years on the earth? He took adaptability. See, after Jesus resurrected, he could just appear in the place and they will not see him again. He could appear and decide he was walking in the reality of who he was originally. Now, imagine the limitation he expressed for 33 years. If you want to go to, uh, to ordinary Bethlehem, you will have to travel. Instead of just, because if he had done that, Peter said, hey, where's Jesus? <laughs> the limitation, so he had to adapt. That's why the Bible says we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities because he went through everything he would ever go through. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Number four, the fourth mistake is not evolving. Not evolving. Not evolving. First Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 28. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 28. The Bible says, But and if thou marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. Now, this is Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church, talking about what happens when you get married. Now, let me explain what that means to us. In the Passion Translation, it says, but if you do get married, you haven't sinned. It's just that I would want to spare you the problems you will face with the extra challenges of being married. Because marriage comes with challenges. The message translation also put it this way. It says, but there is certainly no sin in getting married. Whether you are a virgin or not. It says, all I'm saying is that when you get married, you take on additional stress in an already stressful time. And all I want to do is to spear you if possible. So it simply means there is a stress that comes with marriage. There is a trouble that comes with it. That's why if you're going to get married and if you're married, you must know what those challenges are. As a single, if you go out at any time and come back at any time, you are not accountable to anyone. Especially if you are not living with someone or you are not living under your parents. You make your money, you have your house. You can go anyhow. But as a married person, you can't live like that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You can't live like that. You can't. That's part of what Apostle Paul was saying. You must evolve. You must change. To say, ah, this is the way I am. No, 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 no. When I was single, I was enjoying my life. Oh, uh -huh. That's part of the stress and challenges of marriage. You can't enjoy your life again that way. Every weekend, you will chill with the boys. You are married now. You can't do that again. Because the one you should be chilling with is in the house. With Junior. <laughs> Maybe he's crying. And guy said, ah, go ahead, take that child, take that child, go to the next room. No, 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 no. You did it together. You must enjoy the cry together. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He said, yes, no, when he's sleeping. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. Uh, it's because he's enjoying the sleep. <laughs> Have you had some people snoring before? He's like trailer gear. <laughs> you enjoy it. It's part of the stress. I hear what I'm saying. But say, no, 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 no. When I was single, oh, I, I, no, I can't take this. Nobody was disturbing me. Uh -huh. The Bible already told you that you will be disturbed. It's part of the challenges. He said, I don't want you to add to this stress. You know, when people hear this, I say, no, I, I want the stress. Uh -huh. So you already know there will be stress. So when the stress shows up, you better embrace it. Because those are some of the things people complain about. And someone says, you didn't do that. You didn't call. You didn't text me. You didn't do this one. You didn't do that and say, ah, what is it now? You've forgotten that you are married. You can't be behaving like that. That's the, all those little things. Sometimes when you hear that marriages fail, it is not one big issue that destroyed the marriage. It's an accumulation of little things. It's usually an accumulation. That's why sometimes when you ask the people to talk, when they start talking, you'll be wondering, ah, is it this small thing? It's not this small thing. It's some things that has been done that they can't even remember anymore. That compounded over time. 
Am I making sense this morning? Not evolving. And change is the only constant thing on the earth. You shouldn't fear change. Embrace it. Look forward to it. As a matter of fact, the best position you can be in is to be the one to initiate it. Be the one to initiate it. The person you marry and you yourself will not be the same 5, 10, and 20 years from now. I'm not who I was five years ago. That guy that you're saying, or that lady saying, ah, I like her. Why do you like her? You know, she's just, she has a slim body type. Oh, don't worry. That guy that you say, ah, no, I just like his, you know, he doesn't have pot belly, six packs. That six packs will become one full pack. By the time you start giving him a bar. <laughs> 12 midnight. He comes back from work. When he comes back from work before as a single, he will just drink Gary and sleep. But now, we have made stockfish with F4. He knows that to not eat the food is to create a problem. Someone stayed in the kitchen, made all these delicacies. Even if you don't want to eat, you must eat. So by the time he wakes up, the tummy is getting bigger, bigger. Two years from now, ah, what happened to you? You happened. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So people will change. People will change. And as a matter of fact, if they are not changing, it's a big problem. Some of the changes that will happen is that for men, a man should move from a boyfriend to a husband. Or from a fiance to a husband. To remain a boyfriend or fiance in marriage is disaster. Because as a boyfriend or fiance, whatever name you used to, um, try, um, use, you know, to describe your own whatever, you know, because growing up, they used to say that boyfriend, when you have a boyfriend, is a sin. In our denomination, they say, Ore o konea bani deshe. That's the meaning of boyfriend. That is a male friend that you commit sin together. That's what it means. So for some of us, that programming is there. To use the word boyfriend sometimes, you know, makes you uncomfortable, whatever. You know, the goal of a guy that's not married is to impress a babe, isn't it? Isn't it? A guy that is not impressing you, be careful of him. He's not normal. You should want to impress. He wants to get the attention of the lady. But when you become a husband, your cardinal responsibility is vision and leadership. I hear what I'm saying. It is leading a family. It's no longer, the days of impression have gone. You have impressed. Impression has worked. You can't keep impressing. Because as a boyfriend, you, you are buying things. At times, you can't even afford it. You get money from your friends. Now, I'm not saying you should do that. Too, because you just want to impress the babe. You can't be doing that as a married person. Our strength is coming. And the landlord will remember by the grace of God because he's also a believer. The more you pray, the more the Holy Ghost reminds him. Father, make him forget. Holy Spirit says, Remember. <laughs> so you will move from a boyfriend to a husband. So sometimes these things create a culture shock. Like the baby is wondering, Ah, where is my boyfriend? He's gone. This is now husband. Some of the change that will also happen is that the girlfriend should move to a wife. As a babe, the goal is to look pretty. Huh? You want to go out, you should be proud. Of, ah, that's my babe, that's my babe. Now, as a wife, your cardinal responsibility huh, is building a home. Now, building a home does not mean you don't have a career. Don't get me wrong. Hear what I'm saying, not what I'm not saying. I hear what I'm saying. Because people, there's a way they read meanings to think, ah, so pastor is saying a woman should not walk. It just build it. Building a home is not be, being a full housewife. And if being a full housewife is your calling, do it joyfully. There are people that God has given that calling and we must never deride it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So a woman must move from a girlfriend to a wife. Don't be so fine outside that your home is in shambles. And some people, you see them outside, ah, on fleek, you get to their house, you'll be wondering, the tornado just happened here. A woman should be able to keep her home. The third thing you should expect as the years progress is that a husband will most likely move to a father or should move to a father. And fathering is all about caring and providing leadership, not just for an individual but for a people group. You should have family meetings. You call wife and children. This is our goal for this year. You see, so, let the children know what will happen that year. 
as age appropriate. There are some things that you don't need to tell children, but at least let them have an idea of where our father. It gives them a sense of direction. So when they are kids, when they have school, um, um, mates in school are talking about, you just say, you know, we, that they told us they'll be one day. Our oh, daddy did not tell us anything. Daddy was just watching man you. Because daddy himself doesn't know where he's going. <laughs> did I say something wrong? <laughs> Praise the Lord. When a wife moves to a mother, please be careful not to make the children a priority. Children are a part of your family. They are not a part of a marriage. Marriage only happens between two people, not a group. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You don't have a covenant with children. You only have a covenant with your spouse. One day those children will leave you. And what eventually happens is that people put attention. Oh, come here. Oh, come here. They do that. That's what they call them in my own part of Nigeria, where I come from. You see a woman, oh, come here. It's the son they call, come here. That is my husband, my husband. The son becomes the husband. And the man is looking. Husband. Wow. There are two husbands in this house now. Don't worry. You will soon go. You see, let me tell you, this. unconsciously, some men are competing with their sons. And some women are competing with their daughters. Unconsciously. Because of the ignorance of the parents. Thank God for children, but they cannot take the place of your spouse. You see, one of the greatest gifts you can give to your children is for them to see how much their parents, their dad loves their mom, and how much their mom loves their dad. Number five is not prioritizing each other. That's the fifth mistake. Not prioritizing each other. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. The Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. He shall leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife and they shall become one flesh. Hmm. Some people are married but they never leave. And there has to be a leaving before there can be a cleaving. Some people never leave. Now, when the Bible says leave father and mother, not that they become irrelevant. But it simply means the one you have gotten married to must now be the priority. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Must be the priority. In today's age and time, people in marriage prioritize work, prioritize friends, children, siblings, parents, pastor. I mean, pastor, yes, I'll say that. Some pastors don't have enough self esteem to say that. Some people prioritize their pastor more than their spouse. It's error. Let me tell you this. Whoever the pastor is that is teaching you that, they are teaching you, you know, what will destroy your marriage. I can't be more important even as your pastor in your home than your spouse. I can't be. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? There's only one person that can be the husband of your wife and the only person that can be the wife of whatever. You understand? The wife of your husband. I cannot take that place. So, and as a man, so, and let me tell you, it's women that fall into that trap a lot. And sometimes it's not their fault. It's because the men in their lives are not providing leadership. And let me tell you this, women naturally gravitate towards leadership figures. As a man, your wife should be able to say, my husband said, my husband said. Not all the time, pastor said, pastor said, pastor said. So, don't make pastor an enemy in your house. Do your job. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Do your job. Some men have never prayed with their household before. Never prayed over their children. Never prayed for their wife. And as you are going out today, you make profits. And pastor does that for her on Sunday. So who should believe? There is one pastor should do on Sunday that covers the whole family. There is one you should do as the head of that home. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't prioritize your work above your spouse. You may lose that job. You may change business. Those things can change. Don't prioritize your friends above your spouse. Don't prioritize siblings. There are some families where siblings can just walk into the house and do anything. Come unannounced. As error. Smartphone is one of the things people prioritize now above their spouse. Am I dialing somebody's number? Smartphone. You see people, they say they went on a date to date, but it's phone they are still talking to. I did not go on the date. 
So I need to reply to this message. I need to reply to this message. If you are on the hospital bed, you will not be replying a message. If there is an emergency, a life and death emergency, you will not be replying a message. There must be a time. You see, it's so bad that even in prayer, some people are still texting. Come back, come back. For real? So if you can do that to God, who is your spouse? So since you can do it to God, your spouse makes no use. If I can do that to God, who is the spouse? So some of us, it, it has even gotten to a point that people don't see error in it. The spouse is talking to you, you are pressing phone, you say you are engaged to someone you want to get married. I, say, I, know, I need to send this thing to that client. Let me tell you, this. some of you, the clients you are carrying on your head, if you lose your marriage, those clients will leave you. Number six is not being your partner's best friend. The sixth mistake is not being your partner's best friend. A man by the name of, I'm sorry, a woman by the name of Amy Bellows said communication is the mortar that holds the relationship together. If it breaks down, the relationship will crumble. What that simply means is that the lifeblood of every relationship is communication. The lifeblood of every friendship is communication. It's communication. It's communication. You cannot be talking more to outsiders than you are talking to your spouse. Under whatever guise. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you hearing what I'm saying? I said, ah, no, that container is about to clear. Is every day you are clearing container? Clear the wife first and the husband before you clear container. I read something many years ago. I can't even remember the book, you know, John Maxwell. I was talking about, you know, how maybe like five, ten years into his marriage, you noticed that everything was just nose diving, you know. And he realized that it was because the communication was beginning to break down. So every time he would get home, the wife would ask, oh, how was your day? He say, fine. So what happened? Uh, nothing serious. He said, so he had to really think about it. That why is it that he's not excited talking to his wife when he gets home? He realized that it's because he has gisted with every other person before he gets home. So by the time he gets home, there's nothing to talk about again. He said, so what he did, right, he started using flashcards. Yeah, I this small today. You can use post, um, um, post-it notes, right? He said when something happens during the day, he will write it and put it in his breast pocket. He will write it. So when his wife says, oh, how was your day? He will bring it out and start having things to talk about. He said over time, he just saw that their intimacy began to grow. Many of us, you have gisted with everybody before you gist with your spouse. So when you get them, there's nothing to talk about. Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, let me tell you this. Let's learn the habit. I'm also in that WhatsApp group, uh, especially if I work a holic. Let's learn to sometimes to stop work when we are at home. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You have gone to work, you get back home, you are still working. Who are you talking to? Uh, I, I'm talking to, you know, there's something we need to do before tomorrow morning. Really? It's not easy, but we can, we, can, we, we can work on it. Especially for those of us that work for ourselves, that are entrepreneurs, self-employed people. You can work on it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Number seven is forgetting God's divine order. Forgetting God's divine order. And I want us to see that in Ephesians chapter 5. Because that's the scripture people quote the most. Why? Submit to your own husband. <laughs> husband, love your wife. Uh, they, we use that scripture as a weapon of attack for each other. But I'll show us the first order. That all those ones cannot work if you don't put the first thing as the first thing. Ephesians chapter 5, we'll read from verse 17. Ephesians 5 from verse 17. Ephesians 5 from verse 17. The Bible says, wherefore, don't be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein there is excess. It says, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for the, 
for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Let's stop here. Uh, go to verse 23. Let's jump to verse 23. Verse 23 says, for the husband, 23 to 24, it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church and is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be, be to their own husbands in everything. That is valid. But before the Bible says that, please notice that the first thing the Bible says, if you can go back to verse 17, is it says, don't be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The first order, especially for those of us that are still single, is you need to understand God's will for your life before thinking of marriage. That's the divine order. To think for, see, before God brought a woman to Adam, before he brought Eve, he already gave him a purpose. He already knew what God's will for, God didn't just create him, put him in the garden and say, figure out your life. No, God said, name the animals. Take care of the gardens. You know, tend to it. After that, God now said, it is not good. This guy shouldn't be alone. He now brought a helpmate. Not an helpmate. Helpmate. I'll talk about that some other time, but it's not the same thing. People always quote it as helpmate. That's not what the Bible says. You see, so it goes on further. Go to verse 18. It says, and be not drunk with wine. You see that? Wearing is excess, but be what? Be what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. A man that is not filled with the Holy Spirit that you are teaching that is the end will crush a woman. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you hearing what I'm saying? That is where most people start from. For verse 20, is it 20, 23? It says, I'm the head of this home. The husband is the head. I'm your head. Uncle, before you say that, are you filled with the Spirit? Because that's the divine. You see, people take scriptures out of context. They just take the scripture that suits them. They take it out. So I'm the head of this home. Before you start saying that, do you understand God's will for your life? Because you cannot truly be the head. You can't tell your family what the will of God is for the family. If you yourself as an individual, you don't know God's will for your own life. For your own life. He now says, don't be drunk with wine wherein there is excess. He says, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because it is in being filled, you know how to lead. Because that word head simply means leadership. That's when you know how to lead. The Bible also goes on further if you read in that verse, you know, that passage of scripture. It says that men should love their wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? By giving himself for her. It's talking about selfless leadership. Because the leadership we understand in this part of the world is tyrannical leadership, authoritarian leadership, dictatorship. I am the air. Go this way. Sit down there. Turn off the TV. Go to the kitchen. Watch the place. Sit down. Sleep. Read your books. Assignment. You've done it. No. And you are playing football. Throw that. That's the one we understand. Giving orders. So the first order is you must know God's will for your life and be filled with the spirit as a man, as a woman. It goes on further to say in verse 22, it says, Why submit to your own husband as to the Lord? A woman that is not filled with the Spirit will have issues with submission. Because she will, she will consider submission to be subjection. And that's what this generation of feminism is trying to attack. The fabric of God's divine order. The fabric of God's divine order. You see, we didn't institute marriage so we cannot rewrite the Bible. We can't rewrite it. And I understand, you see, because it is dangerous for a woman to submit to a man that is not spirit-filled. It's actually dangerous. It is. So ladies, before you submit, before you choose to bring your life, because submitting, um, submission simply means bringing, so bringing your mission under someone else's mission. Before you do that, you better be careful and be convinced this guy is at this correct. You need to be sure. In Ephesians 5, verse 33, that same passage, it says, However, each man among you without exception is to love his wife as his very own self, with behavior worthy of respect and esteem, always seeking the best for her, with an attitude of loving kindness. And the wife must see to it that she respects and delights in her husband, that she notices him and prefers him and treats him with loving concern. 
treasuring him, honoring him, and holding him there. So the woman should submit to her own husband. And number two, the woman should respect her husband. Hallelujah. Number eight, as I begin to round up this morning, have you been blessed? It's placing personal agenda above corporate achievement. Placing personal agenda above corporate accomplishment. Now, the Bible says in Amos 3 and verse 3 says, Can two work together except they are in agreement? In marriage, the word I, my, must die or reduce, right, to the barest minimum. And the word we and us should be the normal order of the day. Am I making sense this morning? You see, in marriage, it is just that's where I started out. There must be the death of two people and the resurrection of one people. Don't write some people in the exam. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Go for an interview. You say, uh, we are one people. <laughs> you say, who taught this one in English? <laughs> so in marriage, I, my, mine should die. And only we and us should resurrect. In marriage, please understand, whatever belongs to one person, the other person, that is a covenant, should have a right to it. That's why if we really understand marriage, many people will think twice before going into marriage because they will want to understand it well before they enter. My car, my house, there's nothing like that. You see, let me tell you this. As a married person, you cannot be buying things and it's only your name that is there. It should be and. I can't remember anything we have bought since we got married that is only my name, except in cases where it is not possible. When you say it has to be one name. And most times, when they say one name, it's usually my wife's name. Ah, that's dangerous. Yes, that's marriage. That's why you should marry somebody you trust. Some of us, I pray for you that something will not happen to your spouse. Because the day something happens, the family will show up and take away everything. How can you be married and your next of kin is family member? If that person is not kin enough, why did you marry the person? Oh, but our next of kin are our parents. So you are surprised that something happens to that person. You see, some people, they are the hospital. Family have divided the inheritance. The wife has no say. So whatever you want to achieve, that's why you must place corporate achievement opposed personal agenda. What do we want to achieve as a family? Never step into a year, a quarter, right, as a family without having an idea of what we want to do together. So everything we are achieving individually is towards achieving that corporate vision. Where there is no vision, marriages, marriages also perish. Not just people. Number nine is despising accountability structures. Despising accountability structures. Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 12. The Bible says, and if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 23, the Bible says, I'm being let go. Talking about the apostles. Acts 4 and verse 23. The Bible says they went to their own company. And they reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So even the apostles that have spent years with Jesus, very anointed and powerful, they had accountability structures in their life. And let me tell you this, that's one of the leverage a true believer has. Be careful of Christians who don't belong to any local church. They belong to the universal body of Christ. Every believer should have a local church where there is an accountability structure. Every believer should. You should have a company. Because your, your company, your accountability structure is your place of counsel. Is your place of vulnerability. As a family, there must be people you are accountable to. As a man, there must be somebody you are vulnerable with. There must be somebody that can tell you your head is not correct. See how you are talking to your wife. If they can't say it in the presence of your head, they should call you to the corner. Guy, yeah, you know well. I'm going to you me by nowhere. You see how papa talk to her like that. Your head, you don't cool you. Because you don't buy Benz now. You know they're all right. Because there are some men, you can't say they are true character. Until they buy a car, nobody has ever driven before in their family. Even the children, if they enter the car in here, you they mad? Why oh, you don't enter the car like that? Come on, come on, come on, come on. You see, you don't dirty the car. What's wrong with you now? He's already going crazy. There are some people that even their pastors cannot talk to them. And I'm not just talking about men. There are some women like that too. If you despise accountability structure, the future of your marriage is not certain. It's not certain. Because everybody has their moments of madness. Everybody does. 
Let me tell you this. If you have not experienced it, or you think you can't experience it, wait until some money enters your hand. You say, as a woman, no, I don't have any problem with submission. Eh, it's because you have not started making some money. That's when you will know that it takes the spirit to be full of the spirit and not drunk with wine. Every day is excess to submit when some money enters your hand. When you begin to have access to places nobody has had access to in your family or your husband may even never get to. And you still get home and your wife and not see you. Aha, uh-huh. then we will know of the truth. You see, you can't say you are submitted or you are in submission if there is nothing to test it. It has to be tested. What you say you are doing really has to be tested. As a man, you can't say you truly love your wife until you are backed into a corner where the resources you have are can only meet one person's need. Your phone is bad. Your wife's phone too is bad. And we have to buy one phone. The money you have can only buy one phone. You know, you can't excuse it, you know. If I buy my own phone, I will use it to call clients, make more money, and I'll buy your own phone. You know, it sounds logical, but that's not love. That's not selfless. Selflessness simply means you buy our own first. As a man, you can't have more clothes than your wife. It's insanity. It's not right. I've seen men who have red shoe, green shoe, blue shoe, and the wife only has black, brown. In fact, even the browns already sing hallelujah. I say, no, she's not the dressing type. Have you bought it for her? She didn't wear it. Buy it first. And make sure she wears it. And today we are going, I want to follow me. This is the one you will wear. Hey, she may not be used to it. Get her used to it. When people start complimenting her, she will get used to it. Nobody rejects compliments, especially women. You compliment her. Why do you compliment her? Don't do that again in your life. Have you seen anybody do that? You should just burn do her straight to arrow. <laughs> because that's not normal. Everybody needs that accountability structure. And last but not the least is downplaying spirituality. Downplaying the place of spirituality. God is the source of marriage and to get him out of the equation is a sure guarantee and recipe for marital disaster. Hmm. I've had people say things like, how do you know he's a real Christian? You know, in today's world, there are many fake Christians. If you are a true Christian, you will recognize a true Christian. If you are a genuine Christian, you will recognize. You see, I heard about you know, a, a, a particular banking institution a, a, a while back. Um, there was a time that there was a lot of fake Naira notes all over the place. And so I had this conversation, not a direct conversation, but for someone that engaged with you know, um, one of the bank MDs. And said, one, uh, um, the person was asking that bank MD that, how did you train your staff to recognize? Because every time someone will bring, you know, a particular fake note, they recognize it immediately. So how did you make them recognize it? Were you showing them the fake Naira note? He said, no. He said, we just expose them to original notes. He said, the moment they touch the fake one, they ah, something is different. If you are a true believer, the day you meet someone that claims to be a believer and is not, you will know that something is not right. You may not be able to say, this is what is wrong, but something in you, nah, there's something missing. You will just know. You will just know. You will just know. There are people that, you know, have, you know, especially if they're a loving and caring person, if, like, as a pastor, you see the best of everybody. Even when you see people that are wrong, you still believe, no, 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 this person is right. No, but other people tell me that this person, something is not right. And over time, I've seen that something was actually not right. If they're a true Christian, you know, when you watch Korean film, Chinese film, do you know the difference between Chinese? Can you recognize them? Chinese is Chinese. Chinko is Chinko. The same way when you travel, they also see you as black is black. You know a white man cannot really discern between a Ugandan, a Kenyan, and a Nigerian. But you, you know a Nigerian when you say Nigerian, don't you? Ah. One of the ways, if you go out of the country, where the train comes every two, two minutes, and you see a Nigerian, <laughs> you know, ah, Nigeria, Nigeria, it's coming. Because in Nigeria, you must hustle to enter bus. But he does not know that train will come every two minutes. You don't need to run, it will come. You just know that uh, this guy, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> this one is from Lagos. <laughs> we know, we recognize that. So, you can, so if you are a true believer, you will recognize a true believer. And that's why as a single, as a married, you must prioritize spirituality. To not read your Bible, you think there is no connection between God's word, prayer, and your marriage. There is. Because the more the flesh is awake in your marriage, the more there is a tendency that you will ignore every other thing. 
If you don't spend time in prayer, you don't spend time in the world, you don't spend time hearing God, the day you start misbehaving, the Holy Spirit will not be able to get across to you and say, what you did is wrong. Go and say sorry. Buy our own first. Do this, do that. Just You will think I am the one that thinks like that. You will think you are the one thinking, not knowing that it's the Holy Spirit talking to you. Have you been blessed this morning? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the seed of your word that has been sown in our hearts.